Great. So um, I titled um, today's lecture Cultivating Load-Bearing Structures, and I want to talk about one project that we actually finished a couple of years ago already. Um, it's called the Microtree, um, which is a collaboration of many different entities, um, the Future Cities Laboratory in Singapore, the um, uh, Sustainable Construction Group at KRT in Karlsruhe, um, the Block Research Group in, um, at ETH Zurich, um, and I'm only the one talking about it um, and, and um, presenting these, these images and um, ideas that stand behind it to you today. Um, I also saw that some of our collaborators are actually in the audience, which maybe might be interesting in the in the question and answer session later on. Um, but um, when I start a, a talk like that, I think it's important that we all have the same understanding why, why we approach um, ideas like that. And I want to give you a couple of slides um, before we show um, the project itself um, about the motivation behind that. Um, and so I like to show um, this usually as my first slide. Um, these are uh, indicators of human influence um, by Stefan et al. Um, already published a couple of years ago, but um, it is uh, devastating to see um, what happened around 1950 when all of these, and it's, it's kind of irrelevant which of these charts you look at, paper production, water use, population, uh, GDP growth, uh, tourism, transportation, they all around 1950 start an exponential growth. Um, and that has to do with, with our human influence overtaking kind of the importance of planetary systems. So the scale of our influence on this planet is, is gigantic. Um, and the IPCC report that just came out um, two weeks ago um, again, manifested this and the importance of quick um, and systemic change needed to, to um, yeah, save our planet. Right? Um, and so two of, if we zoom into two of these charts, um, uh, please excuse that these are in German, but uh, um, on the left, you see the global resource um, extraction and on the right, you see the extraction per capita. In magenta, you see um, the built environment. Um, so those are the, the extraction of, of building materials from the planet. And again, this is the same curve. Starting somewhere in the 1950s, you have an exponential growth. Um, and uh, it is important to show both of these graphs because otherwise you could say, well, we, we have, we're more people on the planet, so of course we need more building materials, but also every person, every one of us needs more materials in a similar curve. And I think that is important to, to look at. And so the, the built environment in total, like operational and embodied um, emissions um, over the full life cycle of buildings accounts for more than 50% of resource extraction globally, more than 50% of solid waste production globally, um, and at least 40% of carbon dioxide emissions. And, and so we as architects, engineers, as members of the, the built environment, we have an incredible role to play in, um, in this paradigm shift that is needed moving forward. Um, Talking about carbon emissions, this again, a similar curve, uh, starting in the 1950s, exponential growth. And, and equally, we need to have a basic a mirror image of that curve moving forward um, uh, to, to have any chance uh, to, um, to sustain the global warming within the, the Paris climate goal, the kind of 1.5 uh, degree um, warming goal. So if, if we manage to go down by 65% in the next 10 years, these are estimates by um, uh, um, architecture 2030 here in the US, um, then, then we have a chance to do this. But 65% reduction in 10 years for the built environment for this big sector that we're working in is, is an immense task. Um, and so one way we might be able to do this is by shifting from a linear economy to a circular economy um, and that is uh, one possible definition of the circular economy would be an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. 
that keeps products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times and distinguishes between the technical and biological cycle. And so for today's talk, there are two important or three important parts in this definition. The first one is that this is a system by design. So we as architects and engineers, it's a call to action. We can go to the beginning of the cycle, change the way we design, change the materials we use, um, and thus change the system rather than at the end uh, kind of increase the efficiency of a filter in, in, the, in the production plant, right? Um, and the other one is that um, we need to separate the technical and the biological cycle and the biological cycle, this metabolism, I see a, an enormous chance of um, providing a variety of new materials that are able to fill the, the demand, uh, the gap between demand and supply that we currently have. Um, and so these are ideas that we're following here at the Circular Construction Lab uh, that I'm running at Cornell University. Um, but, and, and so one of these projects is, um, a, is, is research into mycelium bound materials. Um, and this is a research that, as I mentioned in the beginning, has been going on for, for several years in, in different institutions that I've been um, part of. Um, and so we're, of course, doing this as part of the teaching. Um, this, is, this is a picture from a seminar where, where students are um, experimenting and growing with mycelium. Um, we're doing this as part of exhibitions. This is an image from the biennial in, um, in Venice, the Venice Biennale. Um, in 2016, where we exhibited all our mycelium research at that time. And then I want to show today um, in more detail, um, what, as I mentioned, the, the micro tree at the Seoul Biennale in, in Korea um, in 2017 and 2018. Um, so that, that project um, asked basically a simple question. Um, can we utilize um, cultivated materials in a structural capacity? Right? Can we grow um, a material that then is part of a load-bearing structure? Um, and that, that simple goal then um, manifests itself in many, many different steps that we went through in this project to answer um, the, the different requirements that, that this goal um, provided us. And the, the first one I want to talk about is the kind of the selection of the resource. Um, we partnered with a company in Indonesia that was at that time simply producing um, oyster mushrooms for food production, right? So they, they had an enormous warehouse, as you can see in the background, um, where they were growing these, these oyster mushrooms to then be sold at the market. Um, but of course, all the mycelium um, turned into a waste product of that production. So there was an immense amount of, of material available um, that at that point of time had no value, but for us, it, it started to be the resource for this construction. Um, and so these are some pictures from, from the production process then where we really in a, in a large scale um, started the cultivation of these materials um, with a kind of optimization process on the mycelium um, rather than the, the fruiting body. Um, and so this, of course, has to do with a kind of a research into the, the idea of climate and growth uh, processes, but it has to do even more with a question of um, what is the structural capacity of the materials. So we did a lot of testing, a lot of um, mostly structural um, uh, um, testing in, in UTMs. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with all of these um, uh, testing um, for, for the um, um, structural strength in, in, all, in all types, like in, in bending and in tension and in um, compression. Um, and many of these samples were considerably good um, and I'm sure I'm also not telling you anything new here, um, in compression and considerably bad in, uh, uh, in tension or bending. Um, 
And so it was, it became very clear for us as the, 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 as the project team of architects, biologists, mycologists, and engineers that um, when we then talk about a structural application in the end, we don't only have to reinvent the material, but we also have to reinvent the way we use this material um, so that we actually find a form that only um, loads the material in compression, right? In the way this material, the, the, the only way this material can handle well. And so this is where the block research group in at ETH came in um, and, and really helped push this project um, in, in terms of the, um, the development of the geometry. Um, and so I'm going to show a little little video that explains this process and then get back to, to the form itself. Um, what you what you see here is um, the beginning of this design process. Um, this is um, a, a methodology is called graphic statics that is uh, has been developed. Um, that, that that is an old strategy, but um, uh, has been used and developed and uh, also put into uh, a kind of digital um, application by the block research group. Um, and what you see here is a kind of optimization process of this form for um, for uh, a load situation where you only have compression um, in the system. So none of these elements are ever in um, in bending or in uh, in tension. Um, and and of course, what you also see is then the kind of dimensioning of these materials and the subdivision of these materials into its into its different components always keeping in mind how big can uh, an element be that we can actually grow it, um, how, how, um, how, um, how um, uh, what, what is the, the, the kind of size of these, of these molds that we can produce, uh, what's the amount of um, uh, time that we need, uh, depending on how, how um, large these elements get. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then also, how can we assemble this in a way um, that you still only have that you haven't guarantee that there's still no tension or bending in these in these elements, right? So because if you're out of the kind of model ge geometry, um, then of course you're introducing forces into these um, models that that aren't intended and that could really harm the structure. So you see here how, how these uh, modules were then grown in Indonesia, um, packaged up uh, very carefully so that they, they don't get harmed in, uh, in the transport from Korea to um, uh, from, from Indonesia to Korea. Um, and then we assembled it um, and unpacked them. These are all the different modules that you see here. This is, of course, one of the uh, the curses and benefits of parametric design, right? <laughs> All of these modules are, are different. And so um, you, you need to really puzzle this together. Um, what you also see here is that there's no glue or any screws, any fasteners in the assembly um, because of the fact that all the loads are compression. Uh, compression um, that wasn't necessary, right? So it's, it's a simple, there's always only three dowels and three dowels um, were, kind of the optimum because they allowed us to very clearly control um, the, the, the geometry of, of this final um, tree structure. And then here, this is the, the kind of final, the final image, uh, how it stood there um, and all the, the people involved. Um, so, so we built this structure and it supported this roof, it carried this roof, right? So it, was a, it wasn't it was only self, um, uh, didn't only carry its own weight, right? It also carried the load. And it was actually necessary that it was loaded from the top because that is part of the, uh, the geometric uh, constraints to, to keep it in the specific form. Um, and then, of course, there was an exhibition around it, uh, talking about the process, talking about the material resource, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then a couple of last remarks that, of course, this is something that, that um, 
happened in 2018. And so since then, we, we continually uh, developed this material further. Um, we built a couple of smaller structures that work in the same in the same way for for exhibitions. This is in the permanent exhibition in Berlin in the Futurium. Um, this is a small exhibition that we built in in Karlsruhe. Um, but the the really interesting part about these um, continued development is uh, is the question of these these joints um, and the control of these joints and mostly the materiality of these joints. Because in the in the early version in Korea. Um, we used uh, bamboo. Uh, we also have a research on, on alternative um, reinforcement materials. And so we used a kind of bamboo composite to control these, these gaps very precisely. Um, but that always felt wrong, right? We, we're changing materiality. We're not dealing only in mycelium for the structural capacity. And so what you see here now is, um, is a kind of mycelium bound um, high density board. Um, there's only there's only mycelium in here, um, and we basically replaced over time now the the um, bamboo with uh, pure mycelium. And so in these in these boards here, and they actually um, achieve strengths similar to um, to particle boards um, that can be used in in structural applications as well. Um, we have a material that is that is pure mycelium, and that is, of course, um, going back to the circularity of of these materials and the kind of goal of this this whole research in the bigger picture is completely um, uh, compostable, right? So, I mean, that's a benefit and an advantage uh, and, and a curse to a certain extent, but this is a purely biological material that can go back into into the cycle. Um, and so maybe a, 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 as a last remark, this uh, for everyone who wants to know more about this, uh, um, we've extensively written about these projects in uh, in three books in the last years. Uh, Building from waste basically covers the technical uh, metabolism of uh, of the circular economy. Cultivated building materials clearly addresses all the kind of biological. Um, potential um, that our planet gives us. It talks about bamboo, it talks about mycelium, but it talks about many, many other um, wild ideas uh, as well. Um, and then just recently, a month ago, um, the new book, um, Urban Mining and Circular Construction, um, unfortunately only in German, so, um, but we're working on a translation, uh, came out that really addresses the the paradigm shift that we need and the way we build our um, build design manage our, our um, the build environment so that the future um, in, in future buildings are material depots and not um, destined for landfill and with that I'm um, handing this over to the next speaker thank you very much uh, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak and present uh, some of the work that I've been doing with Michael Materials these last uh, these last couple of years. Um, so I'll actually the order of the presentations today is really quite perfect um, because I'm going to pick up a little bit um, right off of the the last project that we saw. Um, but just to give you a little bit of context of this work, um, you're going to be seeing primarily work that's being done in the context of seminars in architecture schools. So these are unskilled uh, <laughs> workers, they're unskilled craftspeople, uh, and to some extent um, uh, have very, very little experience in design or structural concepts. So with that, uh, it brings a, 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 an opportunity for a bit more experimentation. Uh, and so with that, you'll also see that the perspective of the work is a little bit different. We're not looking at this from the perspective of a structural engineer, a computational designer, not even an architect. Uh, the work that you're going to see, and this has to do with the work that I've been doing over the last couple of years, is from the perspective of a craftsperson. Um, and so just looking at the span of my work, again, just to, just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and my approach to mycelium materials, is that intuition, material intuition, comes through experience with that material. And it comes through taking risks. It takes uh, doing it the hard way. It takes wanting to do something new and something that's never been done and being willing to fail uh, along the way. So I've done this in many contexts and with many different kinds of material systems. For many years, I was working in uh, masonry and doing tile vaulting. 
And the logics of masonry and tile vaulting ultimately uh, taught me and, and uh, encouraged me to look at, at, at other things and in particular mycelium and that's what's gonna be relevant to today. But the way that, again, that I've approached mycelium, I think is, is perhaps a little bit unique and it comes a lot to, or it has a lot to do with the way that I was uh, educated over the last couple of years. And so I can kind of uh, summarize the approach in these six points. The first one is to learn from history. Uh, so looking at historical construction sy systems as the premise for doing work with new materials. Computing efficient forms uh, is absolutely something that we wanna be doing. This actually comes along with history. Historically, we had limitations uh, such, such as the arch and the arch is going to be our efficient form that we can at least start with. And we saw a beautiful presentation before that shows how the principle of the arch can be carried forward. Um, the other thing is that validation is always going to be coming through making. This is really central to my work. All of my work ends up in a physically built uh, object that is the proof uh, of, of the concept itself. Um, as best as most uh, often as possible, we want to employ renewable materials. And in the production of these pieces, of these pieces of research, of these experiments, um, it's really key for me to assemble diverse collaborations so that there are multiple and diverse perspectives that are being brought to the table. And then I think most importantly, I think this, this is why I'm so happy to be presenting here today is, is the exchange and the sharing of knowledge. Um, I don't think any progress can really happen unless you share. And so um, I think you'll find that I'm, I'm going to be fairly candid with the kinds of techniques, the failures um, of these um, experiments. Now, as I said, uh, a, it, a lot of the work, at least when I first started to approach mycelium, uh, starts with the concept of compression. And we heard a little bit about this before, but uh, in this context, at least where I was working before I, I uh, encountered mycelium is that unreinforced masonry has to adopt a universal constant. And that constant, which is gravity, has the ability to shape very, very weak materials into evocative forms. And uh, as we know, there are an infinite number of forms that a hanging chain can take in two dimensions. And so this is something that uh, early on when I started playing with mycelium with some friends uh, in Minnesota, uh, Bridget and Rebecca, we knew right away that uh, what we wanted to, to do is start to configure mycelium in a compressive form. The question was, how were we going to do that? Uh, now, of course, two-dimensional forms is not our only limitation today. And so certainly we want to be using the kinds of computational tools that can help us explore a larger uh, set of forms, a larger set of formal expressions, but also potentially giving us a larger uh, uh, array of, of functions that we'd actually you know, employ this material. Here again, you're seeing early trials with mycelium that ultimately lead um, to what I'm gonna be presenting uh, uh, here in a bit. Um, and I just wanted to note, this is a, more of a teaser for later, is that you know, as it turns out, compression might be the optimal uh, uh, way of configuring mycelium, but actually as it turns out, uh, uh, that through working th with this material, through developing this kind of material intuition, this material knowledge, um, that there's actually quite a bit more that you can do with it. And that's kind of what uh, the work that I'm doing these days is, uh, is trying to uncover. So my presentation, uh, at least the rest of it, is, uh, is in two parts. Um, the first one I'm going to be talking about the Monolito Miseria, which is a project that I worked on uh, about three years ago now. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a seminar that I taught this last spring um, and, uh, and the kind of exciting uh, output that we had uh, there. So this is the structure that my first, the first part of my talk is, is, uh, is about. It was, um, it was grown. <laughs> it, is, it is all mycelium. Uh, during the time that I was a, a visiting fellow at the Georgia Institute of Technology in the Department of Architecture there. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to Number one, uh, uh, reach at some, uh, some resources uh, to do this kind of experimental work, but also a really open-ended seminar uh, in which I was able to uh, have access to some really, really bright students who were willing to take on some of these uh, really difficult questions with a brand new material. So uh, I won't go any further without acknowledging uh, the numerous uh, people and entities that, that went into making such uh, a project. 
Um, and this, this is both in terms of those uh, first two little uh, structures that I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about, um, but as well as the construction team for the, for the structure itself, as well as the administrative uh, and other fac uh, administrative and, and the other faculty um, in the Department of Architecture at Georgia Tech who, who ultimately uh, did, uh, were, were, were wildly supportive of me while, while I was doing this. So just to give a background on, on why this particular structure is the way it is and what I think is, is unique about it and why I, you know, I'm excited to share, uh, share it with you. So keeping in mind that I was working around 2017, 2018 on this project, um, this is kind of the landscape that we're looking at. And of course, after 2018, as you see at the bottom of the slide, we're seeing a huge number of large scale structures. But at the moment that I was teaching my seminar, and it was a research seminar, this was kind of what we had to deal with. And in the context of a research seminar, I uh, brought up to my students that there was something common actually about all of these structures. And this is where we arrived at what we call monolithic mycelium. And it begins with a claim that among all architecture scale mycelium composite structures, all, or at least almost all, have taken a common tectonic approach using modular bricks, custom components, or other discrete element systems that resemble historically masonry and stone construction logics. And I think that's really exciting, but as we know, bricks and masonry and stone are not the only way that we build. And so we were really focused very squarely on the question of what other logics can mycelium inherit other than the brick or the stone, uh, really simply. Now, around this time, uh, as it turns out, Ecovative was working on uh, such an idea. How do you grow large colonies of mycelium? And they developed a process called uh, the aerated bin reactor in which they were able to grow really large quantities of mycelium. And the, this couch that was shown in RISD in August uh, 2018 um, is a really fantastic example of that along with a lot of their other uh, products. The other one that I find really fascinating happened, I think in 2018 or 2019, I couldn't actually find it. Uh, but a student at Wayne State College in Nebraska uh, actually partnered with uh, a mushroom grower out there and uh, grew this really fantastic canoe. Again, a really large colony of, of mycelium uh, and then even uh, putting it to the test uh, in the water. It's really, really fantastic. But this notion of very, very large quantities of mycelium coming together in single colonies, so really extreme castings, um, there's not that much out there. So really this is, and certainly when we built this pavilion, uh, it, wasn't really, uh, it wasn't really out there. Again, a lot of this work was happening simultaneously and no one really knew that it was happening. So this structure, um, it was grown in April of 2018 uh, and it stood until August. It was a temporary structure by design. Um, from the start, it was meant to be cut up and thrown away. Uh, just to give you a little overview of, of, uh, of the pavilion itself, the geometry is an approximation of a funicular fan vault. The volume of it consists, sorry about that, the volume consists of uh, about two and three quarter uh, cubic meters or almost 100 cubic feet of my, mycelium composite material. It's a very, very large quantity of, of hemp and uh, uh, of inoculated hemp that, that went into this. Uh, the formwork consisted of plywood, uh, waterproofing, and, and woven geotextile. I'll get kind of into the details there. Uh, and then the reinforcing was a digitally designed and uh, fabric, a digitally designed and fabricated composite wood skeleton. So there are a number of systems that go into this, which makes it so that mycelium isn't doing all of the work. Um, because of the, um, the highly experimental nature of this project, we had to take some safety precautions, and I'll tell you a little bit about those. So again, my work always starts with history. It's very important to me. And so uh, the little piece of inspiration that we took in this case was the King's uh, College Chapel in Cambridge, which is this British fan vault style. Um, now, without being too rigorous about uh, the specifics, uh, again, we're taking a craftsman's approach to this. Uh, we were able to generate the form fairly simply, um, somewhat uh, based on uh, cutting up and, and reconfiguring a mushroom column. Now, again, this was done uh, in the context of a seminar. So the students were given a program. It was actually uh, supposed to be designed for a music festival as a performance pavilion, because we had knew uh, that 
uh, mycelium materials have an acoustical potential, we wanted to try to put that to the test in an architectural context. Um, so the formwork, a large part, as many people know who've worked with this, a large part of growing mycomaterials is the shape that you grow them into and therefore the form, uh, the form work, what is the object that you grow the mycelium in? So in our case, because of the size of it, it had to be uh, strong enough to support the weight of the wet substrate while maintaining the form. It had to be removable without damaging the mycomaterials while they were still alive. Uh, this is really important. They couldn't be made of cellulose. If they were made of cellulose, at least when it was in contact with the mycelium, you wouldn't be able to remove uh, uh, that formwork. And last and probably most importantly, porosity. Uh, these uh, fungi have to breathe. And so uh, as much as you want it to be very strong uh, and, and to be rigid, in our case, we wanted to have these flat surfaces on the outside. Uh, we still had to perforate these uh, plywood surfaces in order to let the mycelia breathe. Now on the inside, well, we just talked about the plywood. On the inside, we took inspiration from Mark West, who was a pioneer, or is a pioneer in fabric form concrete structures. You can see the, uh, the duality here of, of the formwork, which uh, involves a really strong, uh, really sort of massive amounts of uh, wood formwork along with geotextiles, which can make these evocative forms in the concrete. So because we knew that we were casting a very large amount of mycelium, we said, well, why not try to inherit some of the more experimental qualities of cast concrete and bring them over to cast mycelium. Now, like cast concrete, uh, for the sake of safety, for, <laughs> for the sake of, um, of, of trying to actually have some success here, uh, we actually did include an internal reinforcing structure. It's the same way that you re reinforce concrete with steel, uh, we, we said, well, maybe we can uh, reinforce it with some sort of cellulose-based uh, material. So we want it to be cellulose because we actually want the mycelia to bind to that reinforcing uh, structure. Um, and the skeleton structure should allow the, the mycomaterials to grow through. Now you see in this picture, there aren't any holes in these, in these boards, but several hours later, there were, there were many. <laughs> uh, because it was experimental, we were only realizing things kind of as we were going, I have to say. Um, and again, materials that are selected for these internal reinforcings should not be much stronger than the mycomaterials themselves. I will get to that in a minute. I think I have a picture I can show you. Um, and so really it's about safety. Um, there is a problem when, and you'll see that we had this problem that because of the rigidity of this internal structure, it actually caused damage um, or un unpredicted damage uh, uh, to the structure later. Briefly about uh, materials and labor. So we, we grew this out of live spawn that we had express freighted from the Northeast of the United States down to Atlanta, Georgia, where we were. Um, because it was living material, it had to be used immediately. And the number of people working on this project in order to pack it up was anywhere between four and 12 people. And total, the regrind and packing process took about 14 hours, grown for five days and let to air dry. Uh, this is kind of what the uh, construction site looked like. So somewhat like a a concrete construction work site, but not quite. Um, uh, here you have in front people who are, un, or, or sort of breaking apart the mycelia. Um, here we added any kind of uh, necessary nutrients and things like that. And really the main event of course is packing it. So here you can see us uh, beginning to uh, both pack the mycelia into the frame at the same time as we are uh, kind of guiding the uh, geotextile, um, which made the inner surface of the vault. Now, again, this took quite a while. Um, this is kind of what it looked like. We, again, let it sit there for five days. And after five days, we let it dry for another five before we let these guys uh, come underneath and sing. So again, uh, I want to emphasize this part about reinforcing because ultimately what this project did was set up uh, a, a next set of experiments, which I'll share really, really briefly here in a second, which is that there is a need for internal reinforcing, but it has to be really considered, I think, uh, in, a, in a really serious way. Now, the other thing is that we actually had this pavilion and planned for it to be outside. So it was exposed to high humidity, high temperature, high fluctuations. And so it underwent a, a fair amount of expansion contraction over the three months that it, that it was there. Um, and because of that, it also ended up being a very uh, uh, convenient place for other organisms to come in set up their homes and begin to decay away at the structure itself. Um, again, this was sort of, we kind of knew that this was going to be the case and we went into the project knowing this. 
Uh, and so really the, the significance of the project in this case is that we identified significant gaps in the research. We said that bricks and blocks are not the only way that you can use mycelium in structural ways. Um, we developed advancements in construction strategies for architectural scale monolithic mycelium. So this is now, you know, it's a, it's, it's a whole field in and of itself, at least <laughs> in the work that I'm doing and in the courses that I teach. Um, we uh, also uh, validated that, that reinforcement is really essential, but um, there's a lot of work to be done there. And last, that mycelium in most cases is not going to be uh, ideal for outdoor um, uses. So a lot was learned in this project, and I want to just very briefly take you through the work that was uh, done in a seminar just this last spring at Kansas State University, where we essentially took some of the larger questions that came out of that pavilion and given into students' hands once again to experiment. Now, I will say that all, all of this work, uh, uh, at least the work that you're going to see here is being funded by a grant that I'm currently working under. Uh, it's looking at the larger issues of micro-materials in the development of uh, rural economies, in particular of Kansas. And I have numerous collaborators uh, at Kansas State, both in agricultural economics, plant pathology, um, and, and uh, fungal genetics. So the three projects that we're gonna look at, one is, Sorry about that. One is um, a, a stair, one is a woven column, and one is a um, is a gravity formed uh, screen. So let me start with the the welded stair. So micro welding is something that uh, if you're familiar with these kinds of structures, uh, you may be familiar with the term. It essentially means that you're taking living parts uh, that are made with micro materials, bringing them together, and encouraging them to grow. This particular group was, invest was interested in that and they wanted to do it in the context of a stair. So we looked at some, uh, some stair precedents. They did their own kinds of geometric studies uh, at small scale. Meanwhile, learning to grow micro-materials themselves and uh, ultimately took a fairly, um, a fairly common approach as far as, as a sort of unit based. Um, all these modules were the same. Uh, again, really taking advantage of the fact that these are living materials and using the binding power of mycelia to actually bind these parts uh, to one another. You can see that they're also using a substrate here uh, in order to encourage even more, even more growth. Um, because these are all living, they're soft, they want to break, and as soon as gravitational and rotational forces kind of hit these things, the students found out that they needed to reinforce them um, while the structure dried. Um, but nevertheless, they were able to, uh, to kind of pull it off in a, in a, in a rather elegant way. Um, again, showing that this sort of unit-based uh, approach is, is, is interesting, but that because we're working with living systems, that it might be worth thinking about when the pieces come together. The next project uh, was looking directly at monolithic mycelium logics, but then looking at the formwork um, that gets used for that. Uh, and so here in this case, we were looking at the fact that we were using woven geotextile, which is a synthetic product. And the team decided to be critical of my own projects. They'd learned basket weaving and they began to grow materials into these uh, woven baskets, eventually working on scaling up this work to a very large, uh, uh, almost two meter tall column um, that they wove. They packed with a, a bunch of material. Um, they did have to wrap it up um, with plastic. We couldn't completely avoid plastic. That's, I think, still a big challenge in our community and I'd love to talk about that in a second. Um, but then ultimately, um, again, uh, 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 considering that these are non-experts, uh, uh, really a fantastic effort, I think kind of really brings up a whole new set of ideas uh, when it comes to these structures. And uh, the last one, is gravity formed. So gravity formed mycelium in this case uh, takes a very old concept, uh, one that was used by Gaudi or Heinz Isler. It's basically using a model uh, and form, a model making and form generation uh, process and, uh, and bringing it to mycelium uh, once again, but at the scale of the model. Um, so uh, preliminary tests involved uh, growing mycelium into burlap and hanging them uh, with some success. Now the scale up project involved then making many of these things and beginning to stack them into kind of a screen uh, a, a structure, which you'll see in a second. But again, the really kind of incredible thing here is the creativity uh, demonstrated by the students to actually pull this, uh, pull this off, actually find the ways of, of tying these things together, discovering that in fact mycelium could hang. 
um, that it could take a certain amount of stress and that because we were hanging them into this configuration, we could dry them this way and then uh, make, a little, uh, make a little screen wall that we're now uh, displaying in, uh, in our building. So this work, of course, is leading into a lot of the other work that I do in my lab, and I don't have time to go into all of that today. I wanted to really focus on the seminar work that I've been uh, a part of these last couple of years. But um, again, the reason that we do these seminars is to kind of go on to bigger and more interesting things. Um, so a lot of this sheets work, uh, the gravity forming has, has led us to a whole new realm of, of active bending in mycelium. And we'll actually be talking a little bit more about that in a, an upcoming Acadia uh, workshop, uh, which we're giving here in a few weeks. Uh, so uh, again, I've just presented the uh, monolithic mycelium uh, concepts and showing how that differs from a lot of the other uh, construction logics that we've seen in, in mycelium structures. And then uh, just a few uh, uh, tastes of what we've been doing over here in Kansas uh, on this topic. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak. And I look forward to the uh, next converse, or next presentation and the conversation afterwards. That's really great to be here and presenting after Felix and Jonathan. I, I remember the first time that I got involved with something related to mycelium, I was reading their works. And after two years, uh, you know, giving a lecture in the same session with these two is a pleasure for me. Uh, thank you, Dylan, for uh, starting these conversations. Uh, when, when we started talking about the mycelium, I was thinking, okay, we need to start uh, a different discussion. We don't need to continue talking about our successes and the things that everybody know. So I, I brought up something uh, that is more like a one-on-one -on -one course that is, uh, you know, that is going to be shared with the students in our school uh, in, in upcoming fall semester. And I wanna start with that in our uh, session today as well. So I we start with this mycelium structures one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, as all of you, I believe, know, uh, we saw everything different uh, made with mycelium, with this uh, really particular material that we are talking about, from the leather that microworks work on, from the packaging uh, strategies that they have, these great lamps and uh, furniture that we can see with mycelium. Uh, then, you know, uh, we thought then I say V, it's the, the whole community working with mycelium. Then we thought that we can make this uh, material work, uh, way to the, the building industry, to the AEFC industry. And we first thought of the flooring uh, panels or wall panels that we can use. Then it got some more complex and made it something for uh, sound insulation by Mugu our friends in, in Italy and the Netherlands. And, uh, you know, we can see all of these. But one question that always we are facing is, uh, are we going to use these as structures or not? And the first time that uh, I was uh, faced with this, this question was in my first committee meeting with my uh, PhD committee. They asked me, are you really sure that you want to use this as a structural agent, as a skeleton? Uh, or this is just because you have some background in civil and uh, structural engineering. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this for a while. And after that, we had uh, some meetings with, uh, with, with our dear Jonathan, who's here today. And uh, somebody asked the very same question with this very same reasons from Jonathan in that uh, meeting. And it was repeating. And uh, I was thinking, uh, okay, what are the problems with some structures that we have? You can see this, this is the, the Spain Pavilion in Venice Biennale, I believe 2015. And this picture is taken in May, 2015. And this picture is December, 2015. We have a lot of structures that are being constructed annually or uh, biannually, and uh, all of them are being, you know, disassembled and be waste after a short while. 
So why not we use something that we can biodegrade, that we can use in another way after disassembly? And uh, you know, temporary pavilions are not the only the only uh, example that we can think of. We were talking with Jonathan, and we also mentioned the circus, the, the temporary structures for these really great uh, entertaining events that are being held all around the world. So we can use mycelium and many other materials that are that are biodegradable and that are uh, you know uh, advantages for our environment for these uh, different goals and we need them so the the question of why can be answered with many things but i i thought of these two and i believe that you can think of many many more uh, you know uh, answers for these questions uh, our dear felix who is here again uh, he talks about prototypologies uh, the methodology that he he brought up to this context and uh, this says that uh, okay we have to go over different prototypologies the, the not the prototypes you know prototypologies are a little different because when you are uh, working with these you can you can forget some parts of the work for a while and focus on the other parts and try to develop, try to evolve, uh, try to evolve the, the, the material or the technology or any new thing that you are uh, introducing to, a, uh, to an industry uh, with this technique, with this methodology. So uh, for that, I started studying the different prototypologies that we had with my cellulose that uh, was started by uh, Firas with uh, his works, then continued by uh, our dear David Benjamin with this 13-meter uh, high uh, tower with these uh, inner structures, then with work of Yasin and Aridia in uh, this uh, shell structure in India, then the work that Felix talked about, and then the work of Jonathan and works of Karorati and this one by Pascal Lebo. And uh, when we see all of these, we think that, and, and this one, this great one by R. Elise that is here as well. And uh, no, after seeing all of these, we can start thinking about the, the way that we can classify them and see them. Uh, so we can find what are our gaps and what are the things that we can go ahead and develop more. Okay, first of all, we can talk about the discretization of the materials. You know, Jonathan talked about that. All the, all the precedents that he studied were component-based uh, material uh, structures, but he started doing something with the monolithic structures, about the structural behavior, about the form, about the relationship of parts and the whole structure and the fabrication methods. Uh, this is what uh, Jonathan was talking about. You know, before El Monolithum Celio, everything were component-based. This great pavilion started this uh, literature in our uh, area of knowledge that we can use uh, monolithic structures as well. And uh, about, the, about the way that the structure bears the load. Sometimes the mycelium is the excellent, like the work of Jonathan, but sometimes it's only the envelope, like the work that Pascal Libel did uh, two years ago uh, on the right side of the screen. And uh, you know, sometimes we need some sort of structures like the inner structure of the hi-fi tower, and sometimes we need to make the structure hybrid like the way that Felix and his team did uh, in Michael Tree one. And uh, you know, all of these can be developed and getting better and better. Uh, the other thing is about the way that the, the different parts of the material are uh, showing. You know, sometimes it's planar, like the work that Elise uh, and her team did, I believe, in the mark, and sometimes it's linear, like the Michael Tree. Uh, about the techniques of making it possible to make a mycelium structure, the first thing that we can think of is form working. You can see the form working of the bricks that uh, the living studio used for, for the hi-fi tower 
can say the uh, frameworks that uh, Felix and his team used for MicroTree. Then the other thing that is uh, just started two, three years ago is the additive manufacturing of mycelium. And it uh, it adds up a lot of different, uh, you know, positive points, a lot of advantages to the way that we can use mycelium. It gives us a lot of uh, more forms. It gives us better chances to let the material breathe. And uh, you can see that we had some really great, uh, you know, uh, things, I don't want to say structures, made with uh, printed mycelium. And this is the, the work by, uh, I believe, Julian and his team making a node and bar uh, structure with, my, with printed mycelium. And recently, Elise uh, started to, you know, talking about subtractive manufacturing of this material using the abrasive wire cut to have something really great like this with this material that we, we didn't think of before that, you know, because of the, because of the uh, nature of our material that was not cuttable. But uh, she found this way with her team and they are working on that and this is really great so uh after all these after classific classification of uh what we had as prototypologies as our precedents for the precedent study i was thinking of uh, so what if we go to our uh white friend our mycelium friend and ask uh, them uh, what do you want to be how do you want to bear the load? How do you want to serve us as a structure? What they will uh, tell us. And I was thinking, as, as Jonathan and Felix also mentioned, that the first thing that they would say is to use us as compression-based materials and use us as, uh, as smaller as possible because uh, we need to breathe. Or if you are using us as larger uh, you know, elements, please uh, find a way to let us breathe. So uh, I, I went through different things that were made by our, uh, our uh, really great friends in Block Research Group using different things uh, that are working on compression. I saw these different things and I was thinking, okay, how we can start using mycelium for, for uh, something that is compression based. Uh, then I, I brought up this opportunities. Uh, first of all, to see this material like, a, like an unreinforced or reinforced masonry material. Then I was thinking we don't have to use the material by itself. We can add something else. We can double the material. We can make something hybrid. We can add food, we can add textile, we can add anything else that is okay for the material and it's not making it contaminated and it can bind to the material to make it hybrid and use it better. Uh, you know, we, we are not using concrete uh, reinforced. We are not using different materials reinforced. Why do we want to use mycelium by itself? We can add anything that we want. And this reinforcement can help us a lot to to compensate the, the weak material behavior that uh, mycelium shows in some ways. Uh, the other things that we were thinking was biobuilding and self healing. We are talking about a living material, so it can biobuild, it can connect by itself, and we can, uh, you know, let them live after using. And if some cracks or if something is happening inside, it can self heal. And the last thing that I was thinking was using graded materials, like the concrete, like the steel that are graded and are, does, does have different, uh, different uh, grades that let us use them in different places in our structures. As the way that we cultivate uh, you know, mycelium is uh, including different parameters and all of them are controllable, we can make a graded material. We can have some lighter and weaker material for the parts that are in, uh, in, in the top rows of our structures and some more dense and a stronger material in, uh, in the base. So 
with all these, I went through the, the diagram that we always use, the recursive way of going through material, geometry, and technique. And I thought, okay, uh, as a scenario for my PhD and maybe my studies after my PhD, I'm going to start uh, you know, studying the material, trying to find geometries that work for us, and then using the techniques and going back and forth between these three to, to find something that helps us. So the first thing that we started working with was the microcreate, the spatial structure that is component-based. We used formworks for that, and we, we started to use the idea of graded materials for different parts of this, this uh, pavilion. We cultivated 35 different mixtures of this material and started doing some uh, mechanical tests to see what, are, uh, what, what, what grades are good for what parts of the material, that, uh, the structure that we have. Then we started prototyping. This is the, the smaller prototype that we were working on. And uh, the foam works are made of wood and paper because we wanted everything to be recyclable. And as I said, I was thinking we are not supposed to use the mycelium by itself. We can use some reinforcement for that. So we brought up this skeleton for the mycelium inside any, every, of, every uh, formwork that we had. So we had this one, which is the first uh, stuff, uh, prototype that we had. And then we started to work on a larger scale prototype of our work that I believe in our next session in two weeks, Benai, my advisor, will talk about that more. So I'm going to leave this for Benai and going to the next uh, project that I was involved. It was not, it is not my project. It's uh, our Behzal's project. He is now in the audience. He will talk about this project in two, three weeks. I was not part of the project. I was only there as a structural consultant for him. But when we were talking about using 3D printing for or additive manufacturing for this material, uh, we talked about uh, being more smart about the way that we print if we want to have something that is structural. So I believe he's going to talk more about that. I just want to show some pictures. He uh, brought up this idea to use these catenary uh, walls and bio weld them together, which was a really great uh, experience. And then having this really great uh, arch that, we will, that uh, he will uh, talk about that in his session. Then the next thing that we are going to work on, and this is the, the project that I'm, uh, I'm currently starting and working on that is Myconite using mycelium uh, as a hybrid structure with textile based materials. We want to have a monolithic structure this time and uh, like the shot crete, we are thinking of so something like shutting mycelium on the textile and I just wrote shot cilium. I don't know why. And this is going to be done with my friends uh, Farzane and uh, our faculty here, Benai and Felicia. And we will talk about this in, in, uh, in, in the near future when it's being done, but uh, as just a, 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 an initial photo, this is the, the first prototype that we had. And I believe in one of our sessions in the near future, Farzane can join us and talk about this as well. So after all these, uh, I thought, okay, we need to talk about some shared memories that all of us have. And uh, these are the things that some people coming from the architecture or engineering or anything re related to building industry uh, are going for, for the mycology. And uh, it starts with the first mycelium bag that we grew <clears throat> and, uh, excuse me, and the first in interactions that we have with the people from different areas with the mycologists, and they cannot believe that we are going to use those waste bags that Felix just showed us in his presentation as a material for making something that works. 
And then the first time that we touch our dried samples and we are joyful of having something that works for us. So I believe these, these shared memories are valuable to talk about in our discussions after thought. But the other thing that I believe is uh, more important to discuss is the failure. You know, all of us are coming together, talking about the things that we've done and the successes that we had. But when we want the others to start work and develop this area of knowledge, we need to let them know that, okay, there are some failures and let's talk about failures and let's try to find solutions together. And these are like contamination, collapse, decay, the voids that are in our formworks, discontinuity of the formworks, discontinuity of the printing and everything else that we can see. I'm uh, going to share some of my failures with you. And I don't know why it's not working. Okay. The first thing, my material got molded before uh, inoculation. You know, I, I just uh, stored my material in a room and I was not aware that I have to put them somewhere that is colder than the room temperature. So it got molded even before the inoculation. So we need to talk about these things. And this is the worst thing that someone working with my sodium can see. This is black mold and, and green mold trichoderma uh, behind the behind the formwork that you can see here, uh, you cannot see here. And these are the things that we need to find ways to uh, solve these problems all together. These discontinuities, these uh, problems with the formworks, these uh, disconnection here in this picture, or these voids and these cracks that we have in, in our first prototypes. So all of these are the failures that we need to think about. And as one, as one solution, I did a, a test by adding some different materials that can make some, some, some gelling uh, you know, system in, in the material, make it more workable, like the super plasticizers that we use for concrete. I added some psyllium husk to the mixtures that I had. And as you can see uh, from left to right, they are being more workable and they are showing less cracks and voids. So we need to do something like this all together. And this is the nemesis of every uh, scholar working with, with mycelium. This is trichoderma and the, the green mold. And it was right inside of the uh, formworks that we had. And we found that it was on top of our uh, wooden skeleton, the inner skeleton that we used as a reinforcement, not in the material that we used. And this is the, the most obvious uh, failure that we had. And I believe then I will talk about this in, in two weeks with you. This is the largest scale prototype that we had, which collapsed uh, two nights ago. So these are all that I had to talk about today. And I want to ask everyone to, to start the discussion, to be involved with this discussion. Let's publish our works. When I was working, when I started working on this, this uh, area of knowledge, I was trying to find something to have my literature review. And I was like, okay, there is no literature review. Nobody is publishing their work. They are just doing the work and leave it alone. So please publish your works, please talk about the failures, please talk about the different things that you experienced. And it informs all the AEFC community about the mycelium and we can grow this thing all together. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna head over to Dylan for continuing the discussion.